Good evening and welcome to another episode of Fresh Natural Live. We are coming to you live. We have been off for several weeks for various reasons. Um, I've been busy working on a project that we'll talk about later in the show. Uh, and so we had some recorded uh, shows. And of course, we were off one week. Uh, we got one little ding by uh, the powers that be, but that's okay. We're back. And we have a very, very interesting topic tonight. We're going to be talking about thermal energy, thermal imaging, excuse me, uh, and how it can be used to detect inflammation. So this is a very, very important topic because most of us are taught to get screening uh, tests such as you know, colonoscopies and mammograms and the like, x-rays maybe. Uh, there are some tools and technology that can help us detect earlier signs of disease states. And I think it's very important for us to understand this concept. And we're going to bring this to you tonight. So get your pen and paper ready. We have another exciting show for you tonight as usual. <music> Okay, welcome back. So as I said, we're going to be talking about thermal energy imaging. I keep wanting to say thermal energy, thermal imaging, and uh, how it can help us detect um, uh, inflammation very early. And inflammation is an early sign of disease states. And so uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Pam Atkins, uh, who's going to be leading this discussion tonight. Dr. Atkins, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Good Good evening. Hello. Happy to see everyone here and to be here and talk about something I'm passionate about. Yeah, happy to be back live for once in a while. <laughs> yes. It's been a while. And of course, your partner in crime, Dr. Floyd Atkins. Hello, sir. How's it going? I'm doing wonderful. How are you doing today? Just fine. Just fine. And so... So thermal imaging, you know, we've had some conversations about this before, Dr. Atkins, and you know, you've developed an expertise in this. I know you do lots of reading and, and evaluating patients uh, with this technology. Uh, I'm going to let you take over the the discussion, and I'm going to bring up your slides here. But you know, to get us started, you know, what is thermal energy? I mean, imaging. Excuse me, I want to say energy imaging, and and you know what you know. Kind of get us going with an overview and as you get into your slides here. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, you know, thermal imaging is, is something that is a, a screening tool and uh, not everyone has heard about it. And usually in uh, conventional medicine, uh, doctors are not exposed to it. And I wasn't exposed to it in my training, but um, we may have been exposed to it in first in movies in the 80s, a movie like The Predator, when they used those heat sensitive cameras to detect uh, bodies, live bodies moving or, or creatures and uh, with the warmer images. Uh, so some of us remember that and, and bringing it down to more of the present time, screening at the airports when there was uh, H1N1 and come now coronavirus, uh, some airports were screening for inflammatory changes, particularly in the face and sinuses and, and fever. Uh, a fever is a sign of inflammation. And so um, that, is, uh, that was a screening tool for that. And so uh, digital demography, uh, detects the physiological changes that are related to the sympathetic nerve control of the skin. And we are looking at the different temperature patterns on the skin that may suggest something is going on uh, deeper in the body. And um, uh, thermography was something that I 
came across uh, because I was looking something for something, not just for my patients, but for myself. And in screening, for example, screening the breast, in addition to mammogram, what could we be doing to find things earlier uh, than a density on mammogram? Because uh, that can be a light, later finding, but we want to find early changes. So digital infrared thermography, sometimes people abbreviated DITI, is non-invasive, it's painless, it doesn't have any pressure, uh, actually doesn't touch the skin, and there's not, it's non-radiation screening procedure. It is a great tool um, that can help your doctors identify if there's some inflammation in the area and vascular changes. Although a lot of doctors are not familiar with it. And so um, uh, I've been doing thermography in my practice uh, since 2004, and I have been uh, reading thermographies all over the country and sometimes out of the country, uh, images from out of the country are sent to me since 2007. So we can, uh, a lot of people have associated with thermography with the breast, but I want to uh, highlight first some of the non-breast uh, areas that we can use for screening. Uh, number one, cardiovascular screening, when we're looking at uh, the carotid arteries, which are more superficial. When we're looking at thermography, thermography screenings, we're looking for uh, pattern, temperature differences, uh, inflammation is warmer, vascular is warmer, cooler could be some dysfunction of tissue. And so cooler can mean something too. And we're looking for asymmetrical. So, you know, we have two sides of our body. So if we see one side of the body uh, warmer than the other, than the carotid areas, this is more suspicious of some inflammatory change. It may not be inclusion, occlusion, but inflammatory changes, because many times uh, thermography patterns are found earlier than, uh, than if there's a occlusion or blockage. And uh, moving, oh, go ahead. Any court, so um, I guess with the carotid arteries, I don't know if they look at coronary arteries, but have there any studies look at data of increased thermographic heat patterns with stroke or acute coronary syndromes? Yeah, well, I mean, with the coronary arteries, we don't specifically see the patterns because they're deeper, but what we do see in, it's a more general screening, but in the heart area, if we see a blue concentrated area on the left side, usually it's somewhat above the breast, it's not right you know, on, in, on the breast, but a little bit higher, but a kind of blue lake there, as opposed to the right side, more suspicious of tissue dysfunction in the heart area. So it could suggest congestive heart failure or a previous history of a, a, a myocardial infarct. Gotcha. Okay. And this, and this on the screen, uh, we're looking screen in the thyroid area and uh, this area, go back to it. So the thyroid area, you see the two red areas, an orangish red area. The hottest is white in thermography, then red, orange, yellow getting cooler and blue green is pretty cool and kind of purple. Uh, is is very cool. So you see those warm areas on two sides, and that could coincide with the therm uh, the thyroid, and so that may show some inflammation there in the thyroid area. So that would be something to have your the doc your doctor do more screening on. Gotcha. Um, when we look at the extremity, uh, we can see different things and. You know, the, this area where you see, you, when you see folds in the skin, you're going to see warm where skin touches skin. And so that's not unusual. But we see this vascular pattern here. And this could this is, could be uh, or usually is a varicosity, varicose veins. And some people have some chronic pain that the doctor is trying to identify. And not always is it easy to identify that the varicose veins are causing the pain. But that is what this person has, a significant varicose vein. So, and these are different images of the upper back and, and the neck area. Um, this person 
it has some asymmetrical acute uh, inflammation. You see these white areas, warm areas, more on the left side of muscular skeletal than, than the right. It could have been from an injury or something, but this person probably has more symptoms on the left, a little bit over the, the, the thoracic spine as well. And, uh, and you see the two at the other, on the other sides are not as acute. This one is a little warmer than this one, but these are just muscular tension of the um, upper back, um, the trapezius and the, um, let, the trapezius and the rhom rhomboids, of uh, the um, supraspinatus and those muscles. Uh, many times this is where we hold our tension and many times we're at a computer or reading or, and uh, we don't realize we tense up these muscles and have hold a lot of tension there. Um, usually if we see uh, a cooler area in this area over the upper thoracic spine, usually the T2 area, uh, uh, sometimes it's like this with warmth around it and a cooler in the area, maybe suggestive of uh, uh, immune dysfunction, a risk for autoimmune disease, uh, chronic, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, we're screening for that, we'd recommend that. And this is some uh, inflammation of the upper, the thoracic spine. So uh, we're seeing inflammation all over the body. Um, this, this is, sorry, got off the white spots in the previous one in his back. What what might that? He's got like several white, really hot spots. Is this like a, maybe a skin infection or something, or it could be something in the lungs? Or the, these are focal inflammatory areas. So usually it's musculoskeletal. It could have been like a car accident or injury ah. or a fall or something gotcha. like that. I would think something more acute in nature. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, but the history is always helpful, you know, when we do this to have, you know, have some history on the patient. Yeah, let me go the other way. All right. So this gentleman, as you see, has uh, his eyes and eyes area, but and but you see this area that's blue and very cool. So it shows some uh, tissue dysfunction and. This person from the history has a history of Bell's palsy, more of a neuromuscular um, uh, dysfunction. And it's very obvious it's on his left side of his face. Um, even uh, the, with the extremities, we can see different things. Um, this is evidence of a stress fracture on a football player. Many times stress fractures initially because they're not wide open that many times are missed on x-ray but this person had a persistent linear pattern there. And sometimes when they repeat the, uh, if they continue to have swelling and pain and they repeat the x-ray in, you know, a couple of weeks, usually it opens up and it shows a, a fracture. Gotcha. Yeah. And um, this is, this is an interesting study um, from uh, acupuncture, uh, acupuncturists um, doing acupuncture treatment. You see, they are, they're showing sequential decrease inflammation here um, in intervals after having treatment, acupuncture treatments. And uh, eventually you see the, the warmth, the redness uh, acutely decrease. So inflammation is usually redness, warmth, pain, sometimes swelling, all signs of inflammation. And uh, this is the ankle area. Uh, this is a person that had a cast for a uh, uh, ankle injury. And once it was removed, it showed that still had some poor healing there. They still had quite a bit of inflammation. So um, that was uh, interesting to see. Um, on this one, you, you see this person had a history of a right ankle fracture. But what we see many times when we have problems on one side, we put more pressure on the other side or postural pressure. So with weight transfer had more warmth and inflammation on that, that dominant side. That, and I've seen that with people with knee injuries. Uh, this has a little coolness on the knee, may suggest some dysfunction in the knee, uh, or if you see a lot of warmth, inflammation. But um, with knee, in, knee injuries, sometimes we rely on the other side and eventually we wear down the good side. Um, by putting more pressure on it. 
All right. And this is post-surgical knee arthroscopic uh, evaluation. And it just shows the inflammation after uh, going in with the scope and, and, uh, and having arthroscopic uh, type of procedure. Um, this is something you, you see the difference, the coolness on this foot, com foot compared to the uh, some warm patterns on this foot. And this is uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, a neurological change, sometimes post-traumatic, but it, it's characterized by that coolness on that uh, affected side. And this is a, this is a suggestion of uh, neuro neuromuscular changes and cutaneous changes of the right hand coolness here, as opposed to here. This is more of uh, what we would expect. So there's some nerve uh, changes or dysfunction going on in these fingers with this patient. So as I say, it's a screening technique. Uh, even carpal tunnel, uh, we can see. Um, this person had some dysfunction, so some coolness on this side, um, kind of warmth on this th thumb here, and then, or carpal tunnel could look this way if someone has it on both sides and some focal points of inflammation. So let's see. And um, this is, this is a, a person that had a, a motor vehicle accident and the steering wheel traumatized the chest area. And uh, with the x-ray, it was revealed that the person had a fracture of the sternum and a fracture of the left rib here. And so you see the mark warmth and inflammation on that side asymmetrical. Uh, and going to the abdominal area, we can find some things in the abdo abdomen that can give us some uh, clues. This is the umbilicus or the belly button. We expect to be warmth there where there's skin kind of coming close contact with skin. But here there's some inflammation of the upper um, uh, colon, the, the right, the ascending colon on the right going up to the hepatic flexure. Uh, there was some warmth here, but um, this patient actually had back pain. And when uh, they did the thermography, because nothing was seen on x-ray, they found out there was inflammation of the kidney area. And they saw the most inflammation actually from the front. Sometimes you'll see it from the back, on the back view. And so this person had a kidney infection. Hmm. That's inflammation too. Um. This person has more of the warmth in that ascending colon area going towards the liver and had some inflammation as well in that colon area. Um, so, I mean, many times it gives us an indication we may need to eliminate better, you know, eat more fiber and things of that nature. <clears throat> One breast is bluer than the other. Any indication there? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, d I did see that. Yes. And that's another thing, the coolness on one side than the other. That usually what that suggests is maybe more inflammation on the warmer side, mm -hmm. although you, the cooler side contracts you. But also, if you see more of that deep blue in this area, could be uh, cardiac, you know, okay. cardiac uh, dysfunction. Gotcha. And so I wanted to show a little bit about breast because that's what many people may uh, know thermography for. And I did want to leave that out. But the screening, you do have to remove your clothes to do the screening, but there's no touching or pressing of the breast, as I said. And we're looking for the temperature changes. So you don't want to touch your body or, or jog into the uh, for the exam and you're hot and sweaty you know, but, um, and you don't want to um, drink a cool drink uh, right before you do it or a hot drink because that could affect the temperature. But um, thermography for breasts can be helpful for fibrocystic dense breasts that many women have. And it's considered benign, but uh, chronic fibrocystic breasts can increase the risk for having breast density and breast cancer because 
a sign of estrogen dominance. So we want to be aware of that. Implants are, can be screened on thermography. We do it all the time. Um, it, the good thing, there's no pressing, so no risk in rupturing the implants. And you're looking for temperature changes and you're looking for vascular changes um, uh, with the implants. Um, and the family history of breast cancer, many women have family history of breast cancer and want to screen uh, earlier than maybe their doctor recommends them to have a uh, mammogram. Many OBGYNs are recommending mammograms uh, by 40. And if there's no specific family history, some people, some have people have, women have waited by 50 and definitely they want it by 50. But we know the aggressive breast cancers are in younger women that are perimenopausal or premenopausal, and so that have uh, more hormones and estrogens. So um, that's a good screening tool. Also, women of all ages, but particularly below 50, is in more concerned because it's more aggressive. And, and in addition for men as well, because men can get breast cancer, they say approximately 1% uh, of male population in the United States incidents, about 2,300 cases per year. And so we do, we do do screening of the chest uh, area, the um, mammary tissue of men. Um, Willie Keyes asked an interesting question. Could the dark blue also mean low blood flow as well? So you mentioned dysfunction. Is that the mechanism for blood flow associated with that dysfunction, either in that breast that we talk about or the guy with Bell's palsy? palsy? Yeah, those those cooler, bluer areas uh, can, you know, you want, that can be less uh, of, less uh, vascular flow, but what we usually are concerned about to see blood vessel patterns around a cooler area, almost like a donut or surrounding it or a loop, that can be more suspicious of an inner uh, mass or density that's being fed by blood vessels around it. But we do see sometimes with injury, if some a person has had some past injury and scar tissue, they may see more blueness on one side or other than the other. Gotcha, gotcha. Great. Okay. So um, thermography uh, was approved by FDA in 1982 as an adjunct for breast cancer screening. So in addition to ultrasound, mammogram, and occasionally uh, women are referred for MRIs, this can be a non- um, uh, radiographic way to do a, a screening, but it is considered an adjunct. And um, it's important, you know, to know for the younger women before 40, help, it can help identify um, uh, multiplying um, cells that could be uh, increasing the risk for a tumor or a density. Um, it takes on average eight years for a density to appear on the mammogram, but thermography can see significant or suspicious changes earlier. And sometimes when patients go to get a mammogram and they, something was seen on thermography and the, the mammogram is negative, patients are relieved and may not come back for a year or two for thermography. But, you know, we really encourage them to follow up. Uh, because it is an early sign. So usually we do one repeated in three months and depending on the findings may say come back in six months to a year or if we're following closely three months. So um, again, they're talking about dense breast tissue and women and how it can be helpful. Question about the cost of thermal imaging and uh, does insurance cover it? No, insurance really, uh, we haven't seen it uh, cover very well, so I don't have a track record with that. Um, many times, you know, a, a breast screening can be $200 or slightly less. Uh, it's not a, a, extremely expensive if you want to do upper body or upper body with abdomen. Uh, you know, it's a little bit more, but it is uh, not as usually as expensive as uh, MRIs and some other uh, more advanced uh, imaging. Um, this, is a, this is just showing fibrocystic changes. And so this is on the 
on the left side is uh, the, you see the orange and chain kind of bilateral, but uh, symmetrical orange changes are fairly symmetrical. This is more of a fibrocystic change with uh, some estrogen dominance. And uh, so this is the person later with um, less um, estrogen dominance, some intervention with diet and hormone balancing, things of that nature. Um, I do see a, a blue area in the, the thymus area, and that can suggest some immune dysfunction that the immune system needs to be um, strengthened and, and to in, improve that. But that's it's more, it's that, more hmm? it seems like some of that cleared up also in the neck area. There's yeah, yeah, it, 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 yes, it, it, it did. Um, and um, <clears throat> and so, this whole way with the breast tissue is this, like you said, skin fold. So, this, yes, one, and you, you'll, yeah. yes, you'll see that warm, hot area where skin is touching skin, and that is not alarming. You know, we want to let you know that. Now, this, this is very uh, dramatic because you see the right breast is clearly has a lot of inflammation, warmth, and more warmth toward the areola area. And this is actually what um, um, inflammatory breast cancer looks like, which sometimes is, is, is uh, mistaken for a breast infection. And on mammogram, it's usually not seen. And, uh, and uh, but it shows up on thermography quite uh, significantly. So that is inflammatory breast cancer, what it looks like. And um, this is just showing um, a person that had initial thermography and they had some warm asymmetry on this right side. And uh, we were told, they were told to come back in three months and, um, and um, check with their doctor. They came back in three months and it seemed to be getting a little hotter. So the patient went and got a mammogram and the mammogram was inconclusive, um, but they were told to come back in a year for the mammogram. But in the meantime, the patient kept screening with thermography and it, it as you see, it increased and was eventually diagnosed by the um, time of the 12 months uh, with the bi where biopsy was recommended, I guess the mammogram was finally showing some kind of density, and this person was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, so this is before twelve months. <laughs> so yes, yes, the detoxification and dietary changes and removal of pesticides and you know organic and and uh, decreasing body fat and infrared sauna and sweating. All these things can help. You're right. And so there's a lot we can do. Yeah. And, and this person, uh, this person was suspicious for breast cancer. When you see kind of a donut and it's not as hot in the center, you know, that's uh, more very suspicious. Um, so I, I just wanted to just to speak briefly that um, the doubling time for tumor cells, uh, younger, the younger that women are, because there's more estrogen, more hormones, usually uh, under 50 may have a doubling time as little as fast as 80 days. But you see for women 50 to 70, it goes up to 157 days and over 70, 188 days. So a lot of times women that are younger in their 20s, 30s and 40s are not thinking about breast cancer, but this is the time where it can be very aggressive, you know, if found. So we want to do our preventive measures, even for the young people. So, and this is another doubling chart that uh, this chart averaged about 90 days and said from two cells, how in four years the cells can multiply to 65,000 cells. And, um, and uh, this, all the black is before anything's detectable on a mammogram. So we can do thermography at all those times and we can see images like this long before, uh, some, well, many times long before a density seen on mammogram. Mm. So um, don't just stop with the mammogram. And this just want a reminder to our men that there's male breast cancer. And so we need to be aware of that. And we look, we look at um, asymmetrical vascular patterns, warmth, and you see a little looper donut here and this vascular pattern feeding it. 
So this is um, male breast cancer. I think, you know, as we say, those detoxification measures and sweating and infrared and the diet, plant-based diet without meat, reduce, reduce or take away the meat and, and uh, definitely with uh, pesticides and um, uh, xenoestrogens and things like that can be helpful for men and women. So, um, so you know, prevention of breast health, I mean, some of the things, um, thermography is a tool, ultrasound yeah, can be a tool, especially if something, there's a certain area or something's failed, the density of a certain area, you can look with the ultrasound when you're fo focusing on a certain area or ask the doctor for ultrasound, particularly if the breasts are dense, um, fibrosis and dense, you could ask for ultrasound, which is sound waves and not radiation. Uh, we want to avoid hormone disruptors that we've talked to, uh, talked about in the past, um, and even a lot of soy, um, especially GMO soy or non-fermented um, soy, um, all the pesticides and and the glyphosates and all that, and balance our hormones naturally. Sometimes we use natural progesterone. Um, Sometimes we do herbal things. Um, iodine, iodine, therapeutic iodine and iodide is very good for the breast. It's taken up by the breast, ovaries, uterus, and prostate, so it can be helpful. Uh, lymphatic massage or lymphatic massage or exercises where you raise your arms over your head and pump those lymphatics under our arm help prevent um, stagnation of lymphatics in our um in, in the breast area that uh, back up in the breast. Of course, healthy diet and nutrition, which we recommend all the time. So we wanna, you know, we wanna look at those focal changes. Uh, some, like, sometimes it could be uh, inflamed, uh, congested lymph node. Uh, it could be um, uh, a tumor or something nature. We want to look at those things. So, and uh, this is an example what a uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, sometimes they call it DCIS, where the, actually when they do a biopsy, the, the, car, the, san, the cells, abnormal cells are, it's only confined to the cells, so it hasn't uh, gotten out of the cells to be a true cancer, but many uh, doctors treat it as so, but obviously we need to um, be aggressive to prevent uh, anything from developing. So, and this is uh, more of a fibrocystic uh, breast changes before and after. And this is, some people do thermographies on animals, so we'll call this a CAT scan. But uh, there are, um, <laughs> there are um, veterinarians that use thermography as a screening tool. Uh, so, so the human mind is like a parachute. It's of no use unless we open our minds. So look for these, these tools that can help us stay healthy that may we may not hear about in traditional medication, med in traditional medicine. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Great, uh, great presentation and uh, some great questions. You know, um, Someone asked about thermography with dental health. Um, do you, do you see much of that with thermography with dental health? We we do screen the head and neck area, and we do look at the dental area for asymmetries, uh, inflammation. TMJ shows up, and um, uh, but yes, a lot of times I may see some asymmetrical warmth or sometimes it's just general warmth, maybe they have a lot of periodontal gum disease. And so, yes, we with the head and neck, we do screen for some dental inflammation. It's not necessarily pinpointing the exact tooth, but we can get a region uh, that we're concerned about. Gotcha, gotcha. So this um, thermography is every three months, depending on the findings and you see patients with, and you read a lot of outside scans. So you gave us one example of a lady with progressive disease. Are you ever consulted to help with an intervention? I mean, so it, I mean, I, I'm not saying you were reading these serial events, but I mean, maybe you see patients, you see, okay, three months is getting hotter, three months getting hotter, et cetera. Um, what are, are you ever brought into consultation? You're just simply reading and, 
and you know what what what's been some of your experience with some of these imaging you've seen? Well, a lot of the uh, patients that go for thermography have a holistic practitioner mm -hmm. that they go to, and usually are more holistic minded. So they may have a practitioner. When I read reports, I usually have comments, and I like to include things to make people think about or talk to their practitioner about things they can do to improve because I don't like to just take pictures and watch things get worse. I'd like, love to see them get better. So uh, things like iodine, of course, vitamin D is very helpful in prevention, of a lot of cancer and chronic disease and, uh, you know, being mindful of, of checking the hormones and hormone balancing and making sure uh, we're estrogen dominance. We're not supporting that with our diet and lifestyle and fried foods and a lot, you know, chemicals and things we're exposed to. Um, but um, occasionally I've had um, uh, someone that uh, wanted to uh, get a, uh, a consultation, but usually my consultations are more comprehensive and we do blood work, et cetera. I mean, but yeah, I mean, I usually want people to talk to their practitioner and to, uh, to go to someone that can actually do a breast exam and, you know, and to monitor their breast and, um, you know, and order ultrasound, et cetera, if they need to. For for healthcare practitioners who may see this either live or on recording, uh, who may be interested in this technology, is it very cost prohibitive or very costly to uh, have a, you know, thermogram? And of course, they probably send it to someone like yourself to read it. But the, what, tell us about the technology and expense for like a healthcare practitioner who may want to use this. Oh, you're saying if a practitioner wants to do thermography in their office? Is yes. that what you're saying? Or refer yes. them out? Uh, do them in the office. Let's say they want to buy okay. the thermography and do them on their patient and, and then send the readings out uh, to be, yes. images out to be read. Yes. Yes, there are thermal in imaging cameras that can be um, purchased. And um, uh, I, I guess it depends on what you call expensive. I think I think uh, when we started, I think it may have been around 25,000, 30,000, would you say, Dr. Floyd? I'm trying to remember to get a camera. Um, can remember. Okay. Yeah, most camera technologies run anywhere from 20, it used to be 20 to 30,000, I would say around, around, around 30,000 because of the technology. They have uh, the new HD cameras that are, are very, uh, more defined, you can actually see better and sharper images, so you're able to to uh, define a little bit more of the screening. But yes, uh, the, the purchasing the technology is probably the most expensive part. That includes buying the software and the camera. But if you are really uh, proactive with it, it, it definitely can pay for itself so it, based on patient population. Uh, I think people would be surprised at the number of people these days who aware of it uh, you know when we started back in it around 2005 people not many people were aware of it I, I think in houston we were one of the first offices that had a stationary thermography center in our office there were some other companies that did mobile commodities that are out of other cities that would come to houston for the doctor's office to do screening but uh but that was the number one thing another thing is, is getting the images read you, you want to go to a a certified or a, or a thermologist, which is like a radiologist that can read thermograms to uh, be able to get your screens read. Uh, uh, so, so you have information going on. And um, I guess, I guess I'd like to can speak on that because, you know, she's been doing that. But the, the readings actually give a, a, a practitioner more information to go on to determine where to start and evaluate the patient. Because sometimes patients come in with diffuse set of symptoms but they don't know uh it's hard to turn to find out where to start you know what's the most important area and a lot of times the monitor will reveal those areas wow excellent technology for this day and age when you want to try to you know get early detection and it's also like the fact that you can pick up on musculoskeletal um injuries and, and defects uh early to get some information in terms of what's going on uh because oftentimes and you know that could I mean and i can actually present this as a question do some practitioners often use thermography to direct 
of the imaging. So maybe someone has some soreness or pain uh, or some practitioners getting tomography first and looking for hot spots and then determining what imaging study to do after that or how does that work? Well, unfortunately, most um, conventional doctors are not exposed to thermography, and so they're not familiar with the reports and not as comfortable with this. So they use will rarely in, uh, refer patients unless they've been enlightened and and see. I mean, occasionally I run across a, uh, a OBGYN that is uh, aware of thermographies, and when a patient declines mammogram or doesn't want to initially do a mammogram, but says, I'll do a thermography. And if there's some concern, I'll do a mammogram. Some will, will go with, with it if the you know, patient is informed and, and makes informed decision and, and the doctor just documents that they have declined mammogram at this time, but want to do it. But, it, but thermography doesn't prevent one from having a mammogram. I have many people that do both. But uh, we, we know that mammogram is, radi is, is radiation. So I think that's why we don't want to expose women too early. So they wait till they're at least 40, you know, to 50 or so to start the mammogram because cumulative radiation can contribute to cancer. So I've, I've read like a, a book that said, you know, in years to come, they may say, why were we radiating ourselves to prevent cancer? But, um, but the mammogram is the gold standard for screening. And so, you know, I, I, can, it's always, I can never say not to do a mammogram. It's a personal decision. But some people say, I won't get a mammogram, but don't do anything prevention, wellness, nutrition wise, just don't get a mammogram, you know? And that's sort of like, a, you know, ha having a loaded gun if you just say, you know, you just won't do anything for screening. So, yeah. So, we have to be mindful of that. Yeah, you have to be strategic. I like that idea of maybe using this, you know, early on to decrease the number of imaging. Um, just uh, for everybody who's listening, uh, if you haven't had a chance to uh, hit the uh, thumbs up button, also subscribe if you had not had a chance to do so, and hit the notification button, you'll get information about upcoming talks. Uh, also, you join a subscription group. You can also look at previous uh, presentations we've had. And of course, share this with uh, any friends, anyone who may benefit from this uh, lecture and this valuable information. Now, here's an important question um, from Jackie regarding uh, urine uh, biopsy or urine disorders. Can, uh, can thermography be used to evaluate uh, conditions of you know, uterine disease, inflammation in the uterus? Um, thermography can sow some inflammation, uh, usually in the lower pelvic area or sometimes towards the back with uterine fibroids, but it doesn't uh, take the place of, um, you know, a, a biopsy. When they're doing a biopsy, they want to make sure there's no risk for uterine cancer if on ultrasound that the, 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 the in, endometrial lining is thickened. Uh, we're looking, we want to make sure there's no spot of cancer. So it doesn't take the place. I mean, many times you have to think about it. If we have uh, uterine fibers or, or thickened uterus or heavy bleeding or fibrocystic dense breast, there's been, we've had some uh, negative, uh, you know, uh, personal habits, diet and exposures to chemicals and things like that. So Rome wasn't built in a day. It takes time to, you know, to uh, counteract that. So, um, so if there is a thickening of the uterus uh, of concern, I, you know, and the doctor advises a, a biopsy, I think one should get that. But, but, uh, but in the process, uh, do make the changes in your diet. Definitely go organic and go more plant based, and and get the chemicals out and the the um, the smoked foods and the fried foods and things like that that can be carcinogenic. Um, this question you've answered, how often should someone get the thermography test done? I think it's every three months, depending on the findings, but uh, they, their wife- Well, I don't, January. 
not necessarily every three months, but usually the first, especially the first is uh, first, and then for breast, usually we'll, I recommend repeating at three months to get a baseline and comparison, making sure there's no progression. And depending on how it looks, it we may, if it, uh, if it's significant, maybe in six months, but if it's more of a concern, maybe three months. But if it looks pretty stable, eventually we'd say annually, unless someone has symptoms. So, and then other parts of the body, this is breast, but other parts of the body could be annually, unless there's a concern in that area and we want to re look at that sooner. Bone health, osteoporosis and osteopenia, what, uh, can it help us with that? Well, uh, definitely inflammation of the spine and uh, many times with osteopenia, there's pain and inflammation and risk for um, uh, fractures, uh, compression fractures, which are mild, which are not serious, but they could be painful. So it usually does show inflammation. So, um, but if we have osteopenia, osteoporosis, we, you know, in addition to screening, we need to be proactive with the things to to uh, better build our bones. And I'm not a, a one for a lot of calcium. I think we should get our natural calcium like the cows do with a lot of dark greens. Uh, and we should alkalize. Many times when people have osteopenia, osteoporosis, it's a lot of chronic acidic uh, nature on, on your body and acidic pH. So alkalizing can help. And, you know, also weight bearing exercises. And there are some supplements that help. Uh, I'm not a proponent for the osteoporosis type medications because many of them have a very long half-life that, uh, you know, the half-life may be as long as seven years, meaning mm. if you stop taking it, it takes seven years for half of it to be out of your body. And, and the bone that it produces is not always a healthy bone. But um, so I think lifestyle and diet is very important with the osteoporosis, osteopenia. Yeah, it's very, very important. Wow, that's impressive information, uh, very valuable information, an impressive uh, presentation, Dr. Atkins. Um, any final words or final comments uh, for our audience in terms of, you know, just uh, using this technology or any technology in terms of prevention and staying on top of their health? Yeah, I think you want to, um, if you go for a thermog thermography, you want to uh, know, uh, you know, have an idea who the thermologist that reads it. Uh, some thermologists that read thermographies are chiropractors or maybe have less clinical um, uh experience with with breast health and things like that and uh, don't always include comments to things that can be helpful to uh, things to think about nutrition wise and lifestyle where they read it but um, you know so I try to include some comments when I read mine um, but um, and I did see uh, some questions about iodine I think iodine is very important in uh, prevention of uh, breast cancer and some uh, sometimes you will read about it therapeutically helping not just breast but ovaries, uh, uterus, prostate, um, but uh, can be very helpful and supportive of the thyroid. But you have to go to a practitioner to get a therapeutic dose and to monitor, monitor you and making sure you use it correctly. Wow, fascinating. Yeah, there were a lot of comments on iodine. I showed a few of them. Some were suggesting some therapy, so I'm glad you commented on that. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dr. Atkins. This was a very impressive uh, presentation. And uh, as usual, I learned a lot, especially with the um, uh, screening aspects of it in areas other than uh, breast disease. Uh, and so uh, I think there's a broad spectrum of use for this, and, and hopefully more physicians will start to adopt this uh, therapy because, you know, it's certainly painless. I mean, the, the cost of technology is, is somewhat steep, but I think once you have it as a modality, you know, I think that cash prices are not too bad. Many patients pay that amount of money and more with insurance for the typical imaging study. So, you know, you may end up paying a few hundred bucks going to get an MRI or CT scan oftentimes with insurance. And so 
you know, this could be done in an outpatient setting. There's, you know, less hassle going to a, an imaging center or a hospital dealing with paperwork and all of that stuff. And so you know, people have to take those things into consideration. The more you can do in a more simple, straightforward way, I think the better. And, and you know, we try to apply mod similar modalities uh, in our center. So this is very important for people to understand and, and hopefully more people certainly on the medical practitioner side will adopt it, but also on the, the medical consumer side, which would people start to demand, you know, uh, imaging studies like this and, and seek it out. Because I think, you know, basically just, you know, go online, do a, a digital search and find a, you know, thermography imaging center near you. Um, and so uh, I think that's something that's very important. So thanks again. And I will see you two guys backstage. Thank you. Uh, as we close out, uh, as usual, uh, I learned a lot and I think, uh, all of you will learn a lot. And as I said before, hit the thumbs up button, uh, like, and share, uh, please share this with loved ones. Anyone who can benefit from this information, uh, we will be back on next week, uh, back live. Uh, and we have an exciting show for you next week. Uh, we are working on a documentary and I'll be telling you more about that later. So we're working on a docu-series. That's going to be about uh, natural health interventions. And so we'll have some more information about that probably within the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned. Uh, I'll also be posting some things online to share with you to get the message out. But until next time, keep it fresh, natural, and live. Mm -hmm.